So it shouldn't be obvious why we're multiplying these together at all. But we are doing it for a purpose, aside from that it's interesting. So there are some things that cancel out. What do I get to cancel here? How about xz n minus 1? What does that cancel with? The fourth term is the same thing, but minus. So that cancels out. And what else cancels? The third term would be 7. So that x squared, x squared term will cancel. So let's look at this pattern. What about this following term here? That one will be should appear right after the plus right here. So that one will cancel with the next one I would have written down if I did that, if I kept writing. And we look at the other end. We see x to the n minus 1 and a negative x to the n minus 1. That's going to cancel out. And looking at the pattern, the next term right here would cancel with the term I didn't write over here. So basically all the terms that have x's and z's are going to cancel out completely. And what we're left with is the terms that have only one of the two variables, which is negative zn plus xn. I like to write the positive term first, so I'll write it as xn minus zn. <coughs> now there's an algebra I don't know what they call it, not really an identity. Like it, well, it would be an identity. It's the difference of any power you want. Uh, we use it for square powers and we call them conjugates. So a to the m minus b to the m factors is a minus b multiplied by, now this is not going to be very nice for the, uh, when it's not just 2. This is a to the m minus 1. I don't know why I'm rewriting this because we have it right up there. m minus 2b plus a, b, m minus 2, plus b, m minus 1. So you could think of this as difference of m powers instead of difference of squares. You've probably seen difference of squares, difference of cubes. You can do a difference of any integer power you want, right? Here, any positive integer power you want. So difference of squares is pretty simple. Let's look at difference of cubes in this form. So what is my first term in this pattern? What is m? 3. So we got a squared plus ab plus b squared. Just looking at the form, you just drop your power of a by 1 and pick up a power of b every time you move over. So you've probably seen this difference of cubes, even if it was just in the index of your textbook in algebra class, and you probably paid attention just like you're doing now, and that's good. Okay, who cares? Just give me the formula. So let's do that. We are going to compute the derivative of a polynomial. So we're going to compute, well, I'll write down the formula first. This is called the power rule. Power rule. Okay. 
So if you happen to remember exactly one thing from calculus, it was probably this right here. This is the most notorious derivative. So we're going to prove this one. So this is how we would normally compute the derivative right here. I'm going to do this in a slightly different way. Normally we think about x right here, and we send h to 0. So we think of the quantity x plus h, and then we make x plus h approach x by sending h to 0. So that's how we normally did our uh, derivatives with the difference quotient. So we used our second x value, we called it x plus h, and then we moved h, made h really small, which moved x plus h over to h. We're going to do something a tiny bit different. We're going to call the second one z. And how do I move z over to x? I just take the limit as z approaches x. So I'm just going to rename x plus h. And the reason is the algebra will work out better. I could do the binomial expansion here if I want to. That would be another option. So we're going to switch this around. Z approach x. We have z to the n minus x to the n over h. So where I saw x plus h, I replaced it with z. And we have to send z not to 0, but to x. So why do we do all that fun algebra? So I could rewrite z to the n minus x to the n in this algebraic identity form right here. So we're going to rewrite it like that. Ooh, what did I forget to do on this second step here? Looks like an ambiguous n. So what did I forget to switch over? Yeah, what's the H doing down there? So now it's we have to be careful. What in the world is H? So I'm need to do a tiny bit of algebra. I see H down here, but I need to solve for H. So I'm going to subtract the x, so z minus x equals h. So when I take out h, I need to put z minus x. So we need to divide z to the n minus x to the n, divided by, or divide by z minus x. So looking up here, let's see, this equals We just saw this equals z to the n minus x to the n. So if I divide by x minus z, oh, did I get that order wrong? Yeah, it's xn minus zn. So if I divide by x minus z, I get this big polynomial left over. So I'm just going to rewrite that polynomial right there. So that's the polynomial written. So the good news is we completely avoided dividing by anything. So there's no chance we divide by 0. We're not doing any division. So I'm certainly not going to divide by 0. And I can just plug in z is getting closer to x. 
So wherever I see z, I'm going to put x in its place. And you might be wondering, isn't that a legal move? Well, remember, this is a polynomial. And I'm taking the limit of a polynomial. So I'm allowed to just, normally we're used to seeing an a right here, or a number. It's a little strange. So I'm taking wherever I see z, and I'm filling in the number x, or the value x. So it's a little strange because the letters are not what we're used to. So now I have x squared, x n minus 3 plus x n minus 2x plus x n minus 1. So these terms are actually very similar. They are all the same. The only question is how many of them are there? So it's some number of x to the n minus 1's. How many terms? We have to count the terms carefully. I think we did that already though. Did we? No, we didn't. All right, let's count terms. I'm going to write z to the 0, and let's count how many uh, different times z appears. So I got 1, 2, how many are represented by, and of course we have three more we're going to pick up over here. How many are we skipping with the dots? Or maybe easier way to count. Let's see what number we start at and what number we end at. We start at z to the 0, and we end at z to the n minus 1. So how many terms are there? So normally, humans count starting at 1 and going to the end. So what I just wrote right there is n minus 1 terms. But we also have another term over there. We don't normally start at 0. But if you start counting at 0, you have one more than you think. So there's n minus 1 right here. And there's another one term over there. So there's total n terms. And there is our derivative right there. So this power rule actually works when n is any real number. When n is any real number and the quantities are defined. And let's just say and the quantities are real. So why do we have to be careful they're real? Well, if n is something like a half power, you want to make sure that you don't get complex numbers. And if you're going to go from a half power and subtract one that's negative a half power, you won't be able, you will go from, for example, x to the 1 half derivative will be 1 half x to the negative 1 half, which is 1 over 2 square root x. So all of a sudden, you might be divided by 0 if you plug in 0. Whereas, you could take square root of 0, no problem, and that's OK. So you just got to be a little careful. You're don't, you might lose a x value in your domain. So you can plug in. You can take square root 0, but the derivative at 0 won't exist. It'll be a vertical line. Now, of course, negative values wouldn't work anyways because that would give you imaginary or complex numbers. So we'll go for the other rules. Most of the other ones aren't so bad. They follow right out of the limit laws that we looked at. Uh, before we do that, we'll do a couple example problems. So we'll start out super easy. We'll do x to the 6th power.
And the next one, 1 over square root x. And the last one, x to the negative 2 thirds power. So figure out as many of these as you can. The first one's straightforward. The other two are a little bit more tricky. All these just use the uh, power derivative, where you take the power, multiply it by the original exponent, and reduce the exponent by 1. So the first one, x to the 6, is just 6x to the 5th. We'll do the square root at the end. You're talking about the first one? Yeah. So you only want to use a little bit of your brain. Because this is, is a new operation, but it's not difficult. Yeah. So you're just taking the 6, and you go use it as a coefficient, and then you drop your 6 by 1 down to 5. Okay. That's it. It's, that's it. <laughs> so if you're thinking more than that, you're doing something different. I don't know how long it's been since I said this, but there's no try, there's only do in math. You're either doing the right thing or you're doing something different. So you're either applying the power rule or you're doing something that's not the power rule. But applying the power rule is not difficult. There can be difficult parts of it. So derivative, well, bring the power out front, negative 2 thirds, no problem. Now the only tricky part, what is 1 less than negative 2 thirds? Negative 4 thirds, maybe? Negative 4 thirds, no. It's going to be some thirds, thirds. <laughs> and it's going to be negative, negative 5 thirds. So here's a time where you could mess up subtracting 1 and feel like a knucklehead because you can't take away 1. So remember, a common denominator. You may want to go, even though it feels a little silly, and write this. So you make sure you're doing the right subtraction in thirds. Take away 1 the right way. Don't take away 1 in a creative way. There's no try, there's only do. So it's negative 5 thirds. So the most common error in the power rule is not subtracting 1 correctly. It seems silly and easy, but you know, especially if you're negative, you want to be careful. And you've got fractions, you've got to be extra careful. How in the world do we deal with the square root? It doesn't look like a power except it actually is, what power can I write this? So I want to fill in a power up here. So it's going to be negative because it's a reciprocal. And for this, it'll be a negative 1 half power. So the negative 1 would be 1 over x, and the negative 1 half is 1 over x to the half power, or 1 over square root. And now you just do the regular. Uh, power rule. So make sure you subtract 1 correctly. This one's probably a little easier than the last one. So there's the power rule. That's how it can be very easy in the first example, and then it can be a little more tricky in the last two. Where you, it's only tricky uh, because you have to turn it to the right form, 
and then you have to subtract 1. And subtracting 1 is not generally tricky, but you don't want to just gloss over it. Yes, sir? So if I write the, the minus 1, I mean, I could write negative half minus 1, but I'm going to write the, bottom, the, last the last one. Yeah, we don't, we don't do, you know, minus 1, no, So this, yeah. that's the minus 1 right there. So there's our minus 1. Oh. But I just wrote it in thirds because I know I'm going to, because fractions suck unless you have common denominator. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely OK and true to write like this. But then you got to make sure, yeah, you're careful that you subtract 1 the right way. OK, I got it. So our next rule is. You know, called the constant multiple rule. So we're going to look at a number c times f of x, and what happens if you take that derivative? So this doesn't look like the derivatives we've taken before. So let's use the definition. So all I did was feed f uh, x plus h and into the difference quotient. So nothing too fancy here. What easy algebra move can I make? My favorite F word. Factor. I see a C and a C, so I'm going to factor it out. And lim h approaches 0, C times the what is left, fx plus h minus fx over h. So that was just algebra there, just factoring that C out. What limit law can I use here? Or what can I do with this c? We're multiplying c times the difference quotient. Does a limit care about c? It's constant. If it was h, that'd be a very different story. You couldn't just bring an h outside the limit. So this is a number, constant times some quantity. So I'm going to bring the constant in front of the limit. So we're having a c out front times lim h approaches 0. And what do we call what is inside the parentheses? You've seen it many times before. It's a definition of something. We just used it a few seconds ago. It's a derivative of just regular f. So I can write that as f prime like this. Or you could write it ddx f of x. Two ways. Well, there's more than two ways to write it, but two ways that we write it. So what does this rule tell us if we read it? The derivative of a constant times a function is equal to the constant times the derivative of the function. So let's write this out in a nice way. The best way to think about this is you can bring the constant in front. That's the best way to think about this. You can take a constant and move it in front of your derivative operator. So 
So derivative of c times f of x is c times the derivative f of x. So that is one way to write it down. The other way to write it down, if you write with prime notation, it looks like this. And you can choose which of the two that you'd like to use. So the math is exactly the same, it's just the notation difference right here. You want to go primes, you want to go ddx. So mathematically, they're exactly the same. So I want to warn you as we build up all these rules, because this is all brand new, that you're going to need practice to make sure that you can take these uh, consistently without making mistakes. And believe me, we are going to start to layer on some things like this, especially the chain rule gets quite a bit more difficult. And there's product and quotient rule, which come up very soon. And they're a little bit tricky, but as soon as we start adding in the chain rule, it gets a lot more complicated. So you want to make sure that you get these basic rules, um, that you're feeling comfortable using these basic rules soon. And now we'll go for the sum rule. So we're going to compute the derivative of f plus g, and we're going to do it the same way we've done every other derivative, which is definition. So we're going to write the definition down, and then see what algebra we can do here. We have to be a little bit careful, because our function is f plus g. So when I plug in x plus h, it's going to be f of x plus h plus g of x plus h. So that's our the first part. And then it's minus fx plus gx divided by h. So our function is f plus g. So we have to be careful when we plug in our inputs. So let's rearrange this. Wouldn't it be nice if the sum rule was derivative of f plus a derivative of g? And you could basically just distribute. It looks like that might be happening if we rearrange our terms on the right side. So that's some intuition. Let's see if we're going to rearrange. We're going to put the f's together and the g's together. So we'll order it fx plus h minus fx plus gx plus h minus gx, all of this divided by h. So we rearrange the terms. We'll do a tiny bit more algebra. So I unadded the fractions with common denominator. Normally, we would go the other way. Normally, we would go from the last line to the previous. But we've done enough algebra, we know it's the same thing. So we can go either way. The reason I'm splitting this up is I'm trying to make this look like two difference quotients, one for the f and one for the g. What lets me distribute my limit? If we think back to our limit laws, the limit of a thing plus another thing, the sum of two, uh, you can take the limit and split it across the sum, as long as your two uh, terms have nice limits.
So we got the limit of f plus the limit of the g difference quotient. And of course, that's derivative of f plus derivative of g. So there's our sum rule written out with uh, DDX notation. And if I write the sum rule with prime notation, yeah, it looks like that. So it's up to you which notation you want to use. You can write either notation. Uh, you're going to have to read both of them because sometimes the book or I will write it in one notation. Sometimes the book or I or somebody else you're watching on YouTube will write in the other notation. So you definitely have to be aware of both. You can choose to write in whichever one you want. So find this derivative right now. And the first rule you're going to use is the sum rule. The sum rule works if also if I went plus minus. We're not going to spend the time to look at minus, but if there was a minus in between the two, it would work just the same. So use the sum rule first. So you're going to split your derivative up across the sums and differences, and then you have a little constant multiple rule and a power rule. So go ahead and apply that as much of those as you can. And this is new, so talk to your neighbor. Maybe they figured out some part of this already. Any questions or problems? I did make a mistake. So I add a 1 instead of subtract a 1. Where? It's a good question. On the last one. So negative 3 sort of feels like it should be negative 2 and you add 1 to it, or subtract 1 from it. But it should be negative 4. So be a little careful, not just with fractions, but negatives as well. Oh, I thought you did 
So do the yeah six times the negative three. So now we're going to look at the two more complicated rules. <coughs> the first one is the product rule. Now this one is a derivative of f of x times g of x. So we're multiplying f and g together here, not adding them. So definition of derivative, lim h approaches 0. So it's fx plus h times gx plus h minus fx gx divided by h. Now looking at this and trying to do some algebra, I can't really separate the s from the g's without doing some horribly wrong algebra. So I can't nicely separate f's from g's. So what I'm going to do is add and subtract something that will look completely arbitrary. So this one is going to be more complicated, and it's basically because I can't just separate f and g. So I can't write it as derivative f times derivative of g. Why would it be nice to see these two terms together? What could I factor out if this is what we actually had? So I could factor out my gx plus h, and I'm left with fx plus h minus fx. All right, so let's make that happen. But you can't just subtract a term. That would be illegal. You have to. The, what's the only number you're allowed to add? Add. Zero. Multiply by 1, you can add 0. So if I subtract that, I better unsubtract that. Otherwise, I'm going to change my expression completely. So I had to add in that second term, the second blue term, to cancel out the first blue term that I wrote on here. And then I'm going to copy down my last fxgx. So this is a lot like multiplying by a conjugate over conjugate, where you're really multiplying by 1, except this is the analog in addition. We're going to add something and subtract it. So it's like adding nothing or adding 0. And of course, we're still divided by h. So we're going to pair up the first two terms like we just talked about. And then we're going to, hopefully, the last two terms will pair up nicely too, if we're lucky. So we're going to factor the gx plus h out of the first two. And let's get crazy and divide and sp split the fraction in two. So in the first two terms, I factored out gx plus h, and I was left with fx plus h minus fx. And now our second two terms, what do I get to factor out? What's in common here? Uh, fx and fx, so I'm going to factor out fx. And now we're going to distribute our limit across the sum.
So there is some fine print I left off. Uh, all these functions that we're working with need to be differentiable. If they're not differentiable, can't take any of these derivatives. So I didn't really write that assumption up anywhere on the board. So all these functions we're assuming are differentiable in order for us to write down the derivative. So g and f are diffable. And we saw last section that implied g and f are also continuous. We're going to need that continuous fact here. So I can distribute my limit. Let's finish these limits quickly. There's two obvious derivatives here, f prime and uh, g prime. This limit right here is super easy. The limit h approaches 0 f of x. There's no h in there. So that limit doesn't affect f of x. And the last one is this right here. So the fact that g is continuous lets me push the limit inside the function, and then h is going to 0. So this first one right here is g of x, or g of x plus 0. So it's g times derivative of f plus f times derivative of g. Probably not what you're expecting. So this is one that you have to spend a little more time remembering. It's a little bit more tricky. All the other ones are relatively um, easy to remember if you use them a few times.